Good morning to all, and welcome to day five of the summer 2024 St. Macrina Center Seminar on, on the Incarnation by St. Athanasius. We are grateful and pleased to be led by David Goa this week, uh, co-founder and co-director of the center. David, please. Good morning. Good to see all of you. And as usual, when one uh, gathers to walk into a significant work, it always seems less than perfect to come to the end of it. But of course, walking into this work, I hope it will simply encourage you to, um, to live with it going forward. So today we are in the last uh, section of St. Athanasius's On the Incarnation, which is titled The, Refut the Refutation of the Gentiles, <laughs> page 139 to 171. <clears throat> so the Christian tradition endeavors to um, bring what are, at least within our tradition, Hebrew insights into the Greek language and the Greek landscape. This is one of the geniuses and one of the tensions and one of the treasures of uh, the Christian tradition. And Athanasius seeks echoes of the presence of the word embodied in Greek religious sensibilities, in Greek ideas, in Greek images, He continues what the earliest Gentile Christians sought to do as well. You know, the earliest Christians were all Jews. So for them, the Hebrew Bible was, uh, was their landscape of meaning, the well to which they drew forth the water of life. But quite soon, certainly after 70 AD in the destruction of the temple, when Jerusalem became a city with a minority of Jews in it, and since Christians were just Jews from a Roman perspective, they also fled and um, very quickly you had Gentiles, people who were not Jews from various quarters entering the church. So what happens is that the Gentile Christians and thinkers, because they glimpsed the revelation, because they had a sense of the presence of the word, everywhere present and filling all things, began to also look to see where were the echoes of the word in the literature that they treasured from their patrimony. So Athanasius continues this exploration. What do we find of the word? Where do we see it, hear its echoes, hear its call in our own cultural landscape? We see this really as early as the writings of Clement of Alexandria, who died and or was born in 150, and um, so a century and 20 years or so after Jesus Christ walked the earth. So just let me give you, just to give you a, a sense of this, let me give you <clears throat> a little passage from Alexandria, uh, Clement of Alexandria, <clears throat> where he came from and who he was, he showed by what he taught, and by the evidence of his life. He showed that he was the herald, the reconciler, our savior, the word, a spring of life and peace 
flooding over the whole face of the earth. Through him, to put it briefly, the universe has already, the universe has already become an ocean of blessing. Clement goes on to reflect a little bit on one of the places of the presence of this, and this gets taken into early Christian thinking <clears throat> and is part of the background that Athanasius is working off of, I think. So he goes on to draw from Greek culture, really from Homer's Odyssey. And he says, you will recall in the Odyssey, you will get the image here, sail past their music and leave it behind. You recall Odysseus on his way back home, a long, long trip, has to sail around the island of the Sirens. So he asks his mates to tether him to the, the mast, tie him to the mask, so he cannot respond to the call of the Sirens. Sail past their music and leave it behind you for it will bring about your death. But if you will, you can be the victor over the power of destruction, tied to the wood of the cross, the mast. You shall be freed from destruction. The Logos of God will be your pilot and the Holy Spirit will bring you to anchor in the harbor of heaven. In on the refutation of the Jews, our section that we talked about yesterday, as well as in this part, we see Athanasius taking what those cultural worlds treasured seriously, drawing forth what sometimes is a kind of hidden word that they gesture towards, and pointing to how that can be pulled forward, that bears at least the echo of the word, and in some sense, to use a phrase from our tradition, it can be baptized <clears throat> and come to fullness in the Christian revelation. So in a way, in these two sections, he is modeling for us, it's not his intent necessarily, but I think it's at the very heart of the tradition a kind of dialogical approach, a particular kind of stance in the face of things that may even be strange, may even be thought to be other. But in this section, the refutation of the Gentiles, after pointing this out, he first returns to a kind of affirmation. So Athanasius begins affirming what we ourselves see. And there are several things he points to here. That the word has been made manifest in the body. Two, that there is a word of God. He, ruler of everything, and that in him the Father has brought forth the creation. But again, we have to be careful, ruler of everything. We can think of that in imperial terms. But ruler also means measure. So, for example, in the Orthodox iconographic tradition in the Byzantine period, it was common to have an icon of Christ, the Pantocrator, the all ruler in the dome, in the dome over the, the presence of the kingdom in the iconography of the church. That is the church itself as an icon. And there you have Christ the Pantocrator, Christ the All-Ruler, as it's often called. I remember how struck I was by this when I first went into Orthodox churches, and I wondered, what does this really mean? 
And why is it located there? Why is it located where the building comes together, where everything is integrated? And I certainly heard people speak of Christ, the Pantocrat or the all ruler as an imperial figure in some contexts you will see that figure as virtually a figure of judgment and chastisement but when you give it serious thought Jesus Christ is the measure of our humanity. And it is at the center, it is what holds the icon of the cosmos together. It seems to me precisely because it is saying to us, you too can become incarnate, can become an integrated human being. You too can be part of how the cosmos held together by grace, you too can be in that grace in the world. So that second one, that there is a word of God, he ruler of everything, the measure of everything, and that in him the Father has brought forth the creation. And the third one, that by his providence, the universe is enlightened and receives life and being. And that he reigns over all, so that by his providence, he is known. And through him, the Father. But here we come upon that other word, which is, I think, often has been mischievous in Christian thinking. So often when Christians think or speak about the providence of God, they're suggesting something about how, even though they don't understand why the little child died, somehow or other in God's providence, it makes sense. Or many, many other things. But think of the word, providence. Its root is provide and one of the great types of Christ in the Hebrew Bible is my old friend yours too I'm sure Joseph Joseph the provider Joseph the one that goes down and out Joseph the one sold into slavery into into an Egyptian's uh, household back into prison and out of prison before the Pharaoh to provide for his brothers, for those that sold him into slavery. So <clears throat> in that sense, it's a type of the resurrection. He goes on, Athanasius, to speak about the Greek image of the cosmos as a great body. So here he's drawing forth a central Greek philosophical, religious, artistic idea. Here again, we encounter sacralities. And this particular sacrality, creation as the body of God, is current in our own day because we have a whole movement which understands the earth as Gaia, as the goddess. And uh, there's something beautiful in that. Uh, it really struck me when I was first in Thessaloniki. We'd arrived very late at night and gone up to the room and early in the morning, getting up and coming down and going to the elevator. And there you go to look in the elevator to see where is the main floor. And there it is, Gaia. <laughs> <laughs> the earth. So he begins by reflecting on that. So let's let's read section uh, 
42. Ted, would you, um, since this is a good pagan passage, <laughs> would you like to read this? I love you, David. <laughs> I would love to read this. Section 42. Section 42, Section 42 yeah. which is on page 142. For in the way that, as the whole body is activated and illumined by the human being, if anyone were to say, say that it is absurd that the strength of the human being should also be in the toe, he would be thought mad. Because while granting that he pervades and acts in the whole, he demurs to his being in the part also in the same way. One who grants and believes the word of God to be in all, and that all is illumined and moved by him, should not think it absurd that a single human body should be moved and illumined by him. But if because the human race is created and was made from nothing, for this reason they think that it is unfitting for us to speak of the manifestation of the Savior in a human being. It is time for them to cast him out of creation also. For this also was brought into being from nothing by the word. But if, even though creation is something made, it is not absurd for the word to be in it, then neither is it absurd for him to be in a human being. For whatever they think regarding the whole, they must necessarily conceive regarding the part. For the human being, as I said earlier, is also part of the whole. Therefore, it is not at all unfitting for the word to be in a human being, and that by him and in him all things are illumined and move and live. Just as their writers also say that, that in him we live and move and have our being. Acts 17, 28. What then merits scorn if we say that the word uses an instrument for manifestation, that in which the word is? For if he were not in it, he would not be able to use it. But if we have previous, previously allowed that he is in all and in every part, what is there unbelievable if he manifests himself in those parts in which he is? For as by his own powers he comes wholly in each and in all and arranges everything ungrudgingly no one would call it absurd for him to speak if he wished by means of the sun or moon or heaven or earth or waters or fire to make himself and his father known inasmuch as he holds together all things and is with all and in the part in question and invisibly shows himself so likewise it would not be absurd if while arranging all things and giving life to the universe and having willed to be known by human beings he were to use as an instrument of the body of a human being for the true revelation and knowledge of the father for humanity is part of the whole and just as the mind, while pervading the whole of a human being, is indicated by a part of the body, I mean the tongue, and no one says that the essence of the mind is diminished by this, so also if the word, who pervades all things, made use of a human instrument, this would not seem unfitting. For if, as I said above, it were unfitting 
to have used a body as an instrument, it would be unfitting also for him to be in the whole. Thank you. <clears throat> Since all parts are part of a whole, All is part of integrity. It is not fitting for the word to be in a human being that by him and in him, is it not fitting for the word to be in a human being that by him and in him, all things are illumined and move and live in him we live and move and have our being. In the word, the Logos, we live and move and have our being. In incarnation, we live and move and have our being. In presence, we live and move and have our being. The word uses as an instrument for manifestation that in which the word is. All creation, both in its particulars and in the nature of all, is a logoi. Each and all embodiment embodies a word. Nothing is a thing, precisely because all is created out of no thing. All is created out of no thing, out of nothing. All is a wonder. Again, just to remind you, we've said this before, we've talked about a little bit before, instrument, the word instrument, a term that many of the church fathers use does not mean, as we commonly think of it, a kind of tool held apart from us, but as the human voice, as that which can sing, that which can praise, that from which a word arises, or as we see it in a musical instrument in the hands of a master, where the master, and that's what it means to be a master, is played by the music. As long as we have not mastered something, we struggle with it. But once it is mastered, it plays in us. I think of Yehudi, Yehudi Menuhin and his violin, I think of a concert at the end of his life of Pablo Casals, where everybody, where there was no applause, everybody walked away weeping. And when they finally had breath, they said for the first time, I've heard music, play the man. So again, this word instrument speaks of how all manifestations of the word are forms of incarnate beauty. The word made flesh in and through the body, in and through incarnation. He says, for as by his own power, he comes wholly in each and in all and arranges everything. And he says, arranges it ungrudgingly. We could also say, arranges it in joy. No one would call it absurd for him to speak 
if he wished, by means of the sun and the moon, or heaven and earth, or water or fire, to make himself known and his father known. That's the way in which natural religion works. That's the way in which we see the sacralities, all those wonders in nature, and all those wonders in that part of nature which is created by human society, tribe, household, hearth, political leadership, military adventure. We easily deify them. We easily see them as ultimate. Inasmuch as he holds <clears throat> Inasmuch as he holds together all things and is with all and in the part in question, the human being, and invisibly shows himself. So likewise, it would not be absurd if, which arranging all things and giving life to the universe and having willed to be known by human beings, having willed to be loved by human beings. We only know in love. He were to use as an instrument the body of a human being for the true revelation and knowledge of the Father. For humanity is part of the whole <clears throat> it's so odd, it seems sometimes to me, that within the human family, <laughs> across cultures, we easily imagine the sacralities of life, the wondrous mysteries of life. We easily think of them as ultimate. We do that in the various kingdoms and orders of life, in the various powers that are manifest in life, in the various glories that we behold. And it's lovely. And it's a good to, to be able to see the sacralities of life to be drawn into a sense of awe of them and wonder about them. It's not that this is bad. But what happens at times when we apprehend these matters is that we elevate them. We make them ultimate. We make them God. And in that, what we have lost sight of is that the human being, the image of God, and all human beings, sojourners and enemies, as well as our obvious neighbors, that all human beings are the bearer of image, are the bearer of the divine image. When we don't glimpse that when we see tribe as deity, when we see family as deity, when we see nation as deity. It's not that they aren't important, that they aren't sacralities. But when we do that, we no longer can see the sojourner. We no longer can see the enemy. We no longer can see the other. And then we recreate the world around that sacrality. And the revelation of the incarnation restores to our sight, restores to our attention, the mystery of the divine in the human. A mystery so easily transferred onto and projected onto aspects of significance in the world.
in thinking about this again this morning, I I remembered. And I don't want to dwell on this, but only use it as a little illustration. I remember years ago, it was back in 1970 or 1997, that. Uh, a man that I knew here in Edmonton. He was a reverend in the United Church of Canada, deeply committed to social justice issues, uh, did enormously good work in trying to heal the enmities of the world as he saw it. He's now a blessed memory. His name is um, Reverend Bill Phipps. He became the moderator of the United Church of Canada and he was known as a, uh, a very good and very good liberal thinker. So uh, he was interviewed by the Globe and Mail. And that interview led to uh, some publicity because Bill Phipps was really interested in the other as he understood the other. And the other for him was largely Jews and Muslims largely indigenous people, people of color, women who didn't get a proper leg up, all of those people who have suffered in his mind from marginalization. And of course, in that, there is a deep good. One of the things that Bill Phipps said in his interview on that occasion with the journalists, and I think some of them were kind of laying in wait for him. One of the things he said is that he no longer really uh, saw Jesus Christ as God. Uh, and that really got in the way of our conversations with Muslims and Jews. So he was, he was involved in a conversation on Sunday afternoon on CBC shortly after this interview. With, it was with Rex Murphy, that curmudgeonly fellow who used to occupy the radio waves here in Canada. Um, and they had a long conversation, and Rex led him through his thinking. And Bill Phipps did a lovely job pulling forward the notion that women, that people of color, that Jews and Muslims, and he had a set of them, that all of these people were the image of God. And as I listened to it, I just began to wonder more and like, Rex, I said, ask him the real question. <laughs> and finally, Rex Murphy did and said to him, so Reverend Phipps, all of these various minorities you see as the image of God. The only person that isn't the image of God is Jesus Christ. I thought that's what the incarnation meant. That all were the image of God. It was one of those startling moments. And it, it's so remarkably easy for us as human beings to colonize our sense of where God resides. So why is it that we resist seeing the image of God in others? And I suppose in ourselves. What is behind the impulse to erect idols of wood and stone, idols of important sacralities? In our day and age, you can think about what those sacralities are. They're all good. They're all important. But what happens when the sacrality becomes ultimate? What is it that we then become blind to? How is it then that we turn away from the presence of the word?
Is there is there um, matters in this first reading that you would like to pull forward and ponder a little bit? Uh, David, I'm a bit s slow, but you asked the question, why is it we fail to see the image of God um, in the other or in others? Wh why do we resist that? And I'm, I, I'm not clear on <laughs> the answer to that question in what you were saying. Sorry. Oh. Huh. Um, if you, the tragedy of human passions, that is the tragedy of our inner suffering, what is called sin, the tragedy is that we so easily can reorient our life around that suffering. And when that happens, we think of ourselves through the prism of that suffering. We do not I'm not, I'm not talking about consciousness here so much as we don't even have a feel anymore for the image of God in which we were created, in which we are sustained. And we then see the world through that prison, that suffering. I think of it in large terms like this. We have this lovely gift of the mind and our mind has several dimensions to it, not the least of which is our memory. It's a beautiful part of the mind and our imagination, a beautiful part of the mind. But because we have memory and imagination, and Athanasius will go on to explore this, of all the creatures in the world, we seem to be the only ones who can live a life not as ourselves. We can live our life mm. out of mm. some nostalgia, mm. some lost treasure, or some... We can become nostalgic for pain, even. Some wound that occurred in the past, that now becomes the prism through which we see the world. I expect that Jeremy spends most of his time talking about these sorts of things with people. Or we also can live the world through some ideal. The ideals are good. They can be good. It's not whether they're good or bad. They can be good. But that ideal can lead us to think that that is what the world ought to be. So we live in a stance of struggle around what it ought to be and is not. I think the echo that I heard in that conversation back in 97 with uh, Reverend Phipps was that he had given himself so much to what he understood to be the pro prophetic stance of the church, the stance for the marginalized. And that, of course, is part of the, that is part of what is to flow from the integrity of a human being. It's to flow from your healing. But you can live for those ideals without having been healed. And when that happens, those ideals become deity. They become everything. And when that happens, it happens because 
of unresolved passions, unresolved fears and desires. When that happens, um, you engage the works of righteousness, the works of mercy. But I wonder, I don't know, but I wonder if you have the capacity to sustain that or if you don't get into a cycle, a kind of spiritual anorexia in which you pick up one cause for a season, another cause for a season, another cause for a season, and you reorder your identity around the pain of others. That's not empathy. That's an addiction. Or you're reoriented around a fear because you see that life isn't what it ought to be. So Athanasius sets as part of this tradition, which is also saying it is possible for human beings to get below these passions, for these passions to be healed so that you live with integrity, you live as those who were on the right hand of Jesus in Matthew 25, who didn't even know that they had fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited the imprisoned, stood alongside the wounded. They didn't know it because it's not a thing. It's a way of being. Does that help, Bob? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not that I do it, but I get it. Yeah, I wish I did it too. <laughs> well, that's the daily call, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Momentary call. I'll move on a little bit more. Uh, 43, passage 43, we see that Athanasius raises this question, which is pretty ubiquitous in <laughs> in his time being asked of Christians who were speaking about the revelation of the incarnation. Some may ask, why did he, did Christ, did the incarnation, did the presence of the word, not appear in something nobler than a human being? Odd, huh? It's not so odd in our day either. I think of how many students I've had over the years where I have had a sense that they had never been blessed. I had a sense that nobody close to them had ever put their hands on their head and say, may God bless you and keep you May God let his countenance to shine upon you and give you peace. And when you haven't been blessed, when you haven't heard the blessing, when the blessing hasn't descended into your heart, how can you possibly see the nobility of being human in others when all you see in yourself is a need and emptiness. So here, I think Athanasius is at his sort of pastoral best. <clears throat> I draw your attention to this passage in 43. The Lord came not to be put on display. God, think of that in light of so many religious preoccupations these days. The Lord came not to be put on display, but to heal and to teach those who were suffering. One who heals and teaches 
does not simply sojourn, but is of service to those in need and appears as those who need him can bear, lest by exceeding the need of those who suffer, he troubles the very ones in need and the manifestation of the divine be of no benefit to them. Athanasius points out, and the Christian East has made much of this, nothing in creation, nothing in creation has gone astray in its notions of God, the creator, save the human being alone. My point about the gift of the human mind, memory and imagination, and the diseases that can come about, the way in which in one aspect or another of our mind, we will come, a passion will arise, we will come to dwell in nostalgia, to dwell in utopian dreaming, and will be unable to be present, will only be able to project those disorders. Human beings alone, having rejected the good, <clears throat> having fallen out of communion, no longer being present, henceforth fabricated things that do not exist, Utopia, the word means nowhere. That's the meaning of the word, nowhere. Having fabricated things that do not exist instead of the truth and ascribe the honor due to God and the knowledge of him, the communion in him, the love in him, to demons, to lesser sacralities, and human beings fabricate these out of stone, out of wood, into spectacle, into something seeking to satisfy their spiritual anorexia. <laughs> he goes on in this section to invoke Plato, our old friend, who I love very much, one of the great poets of the ancient world. He says that, or if even Plato, who is admired by the Greeks, says that because he who begot the world saw it distressed and in danger of sinking into a region of dissimilitude, that is, disintegrating. Sitting at the helm of the soul, he helped it and corrects all its faults. That what then is there incredible in what we say, that mankind, that humankind, being in error, being in forgetfulness, being in a state of alienation. The word sat at the helm and appeared as human in order that he might save the distressed by his guidance and his goodness. <clears throat> in 44, he goes on to say that speaking to the issue directly with Arius, he asks in a kind of rhetorical way, why does the word touch the body? We need to remember how for Greeks, for people like Arius, and so many I think in our world today as well, there is a kind of split between body and soul, 
a sense that the physical and the spiritual are not do not adhere to each other, are not part of the same matter. It's ubiquitous. Only human beings can live disembodied. Only human beings can live disembodied. My cat, Tom, surely doesn't live disembodied. I mean, I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems to me to be the case. Not only, only can human beings live disembodied, but we seem to have an appetite for it. Only us human beings are able to live for something that does not exist. Only us human beings can be beside ourselves. Not in the ecstasy of wonder, but in the exiting of the flesh. The healer and savior had to come among us, who had already been created to heal what exists, not to bring something else, not to speak to a part, but to heal what already exists and what one has tragically lost touch with. It's a lovely phrase. Why does the word touch the body? <clears throat> it is human beings who, who taste corruption and death. And in so doing, forget they are incarnate beings in the body of the body, the body. He goes on to speak again of the kind of root of this disease. <laughs> if death was kept away from it by a command only, it would still be no less mortal and corrupt according to the principle of bodies, but that this should not be, that is, it wasn't good enough for the divine <clears throat> to issue a command, to impose, to require. The divine, the word, the incorporal word of God became flesh. And thus, no longer fears death or corruption. If we could but see, need to reign in our life. Let me give you this again. If death was kept away from it by a command only, it would still be no less mortal and corrupt according to the principle of bodies. But that this should not be, it put on the incorporal word of God. The word became flesh. And thus no longer fears death or corruption having life as a garment and corruption being destroyed in it, having life as a garment. Incarnate in life, no longer discarnate in our peace, even if it's important, our peace, of life, a passion. So I 
have this question. Can we become one with the word of God? Is that part of what Athanasius is gesturing towards, calling us to? Is this not what it means to recover the divine image seen in others? The word of God, the incarnation, did not come to save the soul, did not come to save particular people, did not come to save the righteous, did not come to save the church. It came to save the world, the whole of the cosmos, to restore the logoi that is creation. The incarnation restores the human nature and each human person in their particularity. <clears throat> I also thought that maybe we should read 45. Um, Yeah, let's let's do that. Um, Jeremy, are you? Would you be willing to read forty five for us? Sure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Properly. Properly, therefore, the word of God took a body and used a human instrument in order to give life to the body and in order that just as he is known in creation by his works so also he might act in a human being and show himself everywhere leaving nothing barren of his divinity and knowledge again i repeat resuming what we said before the savior did this in order that as he fills everything everywhere by his presence so also he might fill all things with the knowledge of himself. As the divine scriptures say, the whole earth is filled with the knowledge of God. For if anyone wishes to look up to the heavens, he sees its arrangement. Or if he cannot raise his gaze to heaven, but only to human beings, he sees through his work, his power incomparable to that of human beings, and knows that he alone among human beings is the word of God. But if anyone is turned astray by demons and is in fear of them, he sees him driving them out and judges that he is their master. If he has sunk into the nature of the waters and they think that they are God, as the Egyptians reverence the water, he sees it transformed by him and knows the Lord to be the creator. If he has descended even to Hades, and gazes in awe at the heroes who have descended there as if they were gods. Yet he sees the fact of his resurrection and the victory over death, and concludes that even among them Christ alone is the true Lord and God. For the Lord touched all parts of creation, and freed and disabused everything from error, from every error, as Paul said, disarming the principalities and powers, he has triumphed on the cross. In order that no one might be any longer to see, but might find everywhere the true word of God. So the human being, henceforth closed in on every side and seeing everywhere, that is in heaven, in hell, in the human being, the divinity of the word unfolded over the earth, is no longer deceived concerning God, but reveres him alone, through him rightly knows the Father. By these arguments, then, 
from their, their coherence, even the Greeks will reasonably be put to shame by us. But if they reckon these remarks insufficient to shame them, let, the be, let them be convinced of what we say when those things manifest to the sight of all. Thank you. Athanasius then spends some time walking through the various forms that sacrality takes on in the ancient world. <laughs> and um, bringing them to mind. His central concern here, it seems to me, is that idolatry, that is the elevation of a sacrality, as important as it might be to the ultimate, always separates, always divides. And it is that movement of mind which sees as ultimate something that is sacred. It is in that movement of the mind that the human person, that the world, and that God are seen through a prism of corruption, are not, are not seen, are not, we're not present to them in their integrity. The least we could say is that the integrity of all is, is, is clouded for us. And the incarnation of the word, Christ, unites all, restores sacralities to their proper place as manifestations of grace that holds the universe together. He speaks of the human beings <laughs> going to consult oracles. That's uh, a common human habit. Didn't end when Delphi uh, ended. It's common for us to to try and augur the future and understand the past, especially when there is pain associated with it, to try and give some human proportion to those things which, which are areas of struggle. In section 50, <clears throat> he talks of kings, tyrants, wise teachers, and philosophers who taught well alive. He also points out that in that world, when they are taken, when we become their disciples instead of their students or citizens, but when we become their disciples, then there is contention because there's contention among them and their followers. We see that in human history. We erect idols to them, images of them, the kingdoms and the power and the glory is all in this world, is all freeze framed in this world. And each of them, alas, really becomes a kind of icon of our passions, of our sufferings. Remember the first time I met Yaroslav Pelikan sitting in his office, <laughs> he said to me in his somewhat sonorous voice, I am a student of Socrates and I seek to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This was his way of holding the Hebrew and Greek world together. Christ teaches and persuades human beings to lay aside their passions, to lay aside the prisms of death. As the Apostle Paul says, 
we're invited to a renewal of our mind. We're invited to know the peace that pathest understanding, the peace that lies beyond the divisions. This is the fruit of the prayer Jesus Christ taught, at the end of which we say, <clears throat> for thine is the kingdom. For thine is the power. And for thine is the glory unto ages of ages. That is a, at the heart of our spiritual discipline, because it's the heart of prayer, is to not become the cap, not be captured by the temporal. Because when you're captured by the temporal, you're not present to the to what is temporal, much less to what is trying to be born in the temporal moment. Athanasius goes on to say that when the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is section 51, <clears throat> was taken up in many countries, he talks about how, so this is the fourth century, so he saw a bit of this, taking root in particular regions. There he saw that the power of the sword, the power to protect, the power to defend, the power to conquer, was turned into, he says, the staff of the good shepherd. That enmity between people turns to empathy, alienation to communion. The other becomes a treasure. The other is also seen as the image of God. So Christ unites in peace those who previously saw others as enemy. He talks about how Christ turns us from war to farming to cultivating. He talks of how the Christian stretches forth his or her arms as the Theotokos does, welcoming the world instead of closing themselves off from what is given. He talks also about how that energy to battle becomes the energy we use for nepsis, for being awake, for attending to how the passions in our mind and heart rise up again and we begin to reframe the world again, that that's where the battle is. The real battle is in the mind and the heart of human beings. He also says that as disciples of Christ, virtue returns. That is, we glimpse again that excellence can be had it's excellence, you know, erite. What is the best that is? Not some ideal, but what is the best given? I think of Simeon's work with stone, minerals, how to draw forth the excellence that is there the beauty that is there, not something else, not something ideal. What is incarnate? What is embodied and in life?
virtue returns. A concern for what is in its integrity. Not how it sees itself, but in its integrity. And then death no longer has its hold, its sway on us. Then in some sense, we all become martyrs. That is, we all become witnesses who are attentive to the word present before us without fear of death. And that doesn't just mean physical death. It means without fear of that which out of our passions we may see as challenging who we are. Because that's really where death is ruling in us. Christ is the master of the universe. Death itself no longer holds sway but rather the anointed one holds sway, the word holds sway. We are alongside it, and that is the, the place of our attending. In Athanasius's world, and in ours also, I think, alas, <clears throat> the human body may so often be seen as secondary, subservient to a larger passion. The human being, the human body, he talks about it, an echo of what was going on in his culture, is seen as a paltry thing in light of the world, in the light of the worldly kingdoms, in the light of worldly power and glory. It's seen as a paltry thing. He takes this up and moves it along. So a passage from section 54. <clears throat> and that through such a paltry thing, the body. Things divine have been manifest to us, and that through death, incorruptibility has come to all. And through the incarnation of the word, the universal providence, and its giver and creator, the very word of God has been made known. And here we have the sentence that perhaps Athanasius is most commonly remembered by. For he was incarnate. For the word was incarnate. For the word became flesh. For God was incarnate that we might be God. and manifest himself through a body that we might receive an idea, a glimpse of the invisibility of the Father, of the mystery of the creator of all that is, the sustainer of the world. And he endured the insults of human beings that we might inherit incorruptibility. What does it mean to be made God? He says made God. You know what it says in the creed? Begotten, not made. One with the Father. But that's not us. We were created. Now made God. What does it mean? What does this mean to be made God? Is it 
a kind of recovery of the image and likeness of God? Is it the fullness of our personhood as it rises in presence to what is given? And in this grace, we are an icon of the icon of God. We are an icon of Christ. What does it mean? What do you make of it? For he was incarnate that we might be made God. We're an icon of the icon of God. What does that mean? Jesus Christ walked the pathways of the Galilee, the streets of Jerusalem. <laughs> he encounters people. They reach out and touch him. He's brought to trial. He's scourged. He's crucified. He dies. That's the icon of God. That we might be made God. That we might walk. That we might encounter. That we might engage. The cross. The dying. What are your thoughts? That he was incarnate. That we might be made. God. People quote it often enough, but I, I keep wondering what, what does it mean? King struck. Uh, sorry, David. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with all kinds of gifts of uh, thoughts and wonderings, and I sit uh, right above my computer is uh, Rublev's icon of the of the three visitors, which is an interesting incarnation of the Trinity to Abraham, and my understanding of Rublev's point was this invitation into this eternal love given, received, and returned, and we're invited into that. And, and so, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about that, and then right beside it, I have this quote from Simone Weil on attentive. At the very end of it, she she has this great, this great phrasing uh, about attentive, the attentive look, when the soul empties itself of all its own contents in order to receive into itself the being that it is looking at, just as it is in all its truth. It is only capable of this if it is capable of attention. And I'm struck by, um, the, the and, and before we started, I, I was talking to you briefly, David, about this idea of corruption and 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 my brain is kind of moving back and forth with with mechanisms and timelines and and it's it, it's so beyond this what what um, what Athanasius is getting at in terms of uh, and, and and so that's where I sit I sit in this invitation I sit in wondering what emptying oneself to receive oneself the afflicted. And, and that kind of jumps me back again to how we see one another, the see deep uh, below the surface of iniquity, the twisted, the bent, the distorted, and to see that God is incarnate in that, revealed in that. 
And so what does it mean to be made God and putting on the incorruptible, which for me seems like this is what happens after we die, entering into glory. But Athanasius is he's not focusing on that just after human timeline. He's talking about now. And so I'm feeling, thinking, dwelling in all this. And that's that's my musings about what what does it mean to be made God? Because my my conservative Lutheran foundations with uh, pietism to be made God, you just don't say those things <laughs> because only God is God. I'm not. And so that's why it's so beautiful about this 1,700-year-old statement that is so defining and beautiful. And so I just dwell in that also without an answer, but wondering curiously with you. And maybe many of us are in that same space of curiosity. Um, those are just, my thoughts. Just a couple responses. Corrupt. Yeah. Disrupt. Mm -hmm. Interrupt. Rupture. So good. We are ruptured. What happened, what is so beautifully revealed to us in how death comes to be is an interruption. Adama, Adama, Eva, Eva. Where did you go? Why did you interrupt our communion? Who told you you were naked? Who told you you weren't in the image of God? Yeah. Who told you that to be God is to know good and evil? Who told you that? Why? Were you interrupted in the naming of the world, in the blessing of the world, that all the cosmos is blessed? Oh, Adama, oh, Eva, come back. Human nature, come back. Human persons, come back. Don't live in interruption, live in presence. And when we say, might be made God, we're not talking about Zeus. We're not talking about Baal. We're not talking about Osiris or Ra. We're talking about the rabbi from Nazareth, the one who walks the Galilee, the streets of Jerusalem, the one who meets the woman at the well, the one who goes to lunch with Zacchaeus, the one who asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? Have I been so long with you and yet you do not know me? The one who stands before Pilate, silent. When accused, the only words are, you say so. The one who is silent, perhaps with his arm around the woman accused. the one who walks the Via Della Rosa, the one who from the cross says, mother, meet your son, son, meet your mother. The one who from the cross 
says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. One who from the cross, quoting the Psalms, says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? That's God. That's the incarnation. That's what it means to be made, that we might be made God, that we might be present in all of what life offers. God was crucified. The last word is, into thy hands, not Herod's, not the Sanhedrin, not his disciples who had all fled, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. that we might be made God. We are images, we are icons of the icon of God, Jesus Christ. That's the invitation. And only then is it possible to pray for thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Outside of that, the kingdoms, the power, and the glory are all ours. They're all our projections. They're all our passions, our suffering. Robbing us of the world. Robbing us of ourself, our logoi, robbing us of the word that we are. And of course, robbing us of God. Other things you might wish to say about for he was incarnated that we might be made God. I have a different sort of response um, away from images of the Savior's life. Mm -hmm. Yesterday we read the section titled Refutation of the Jews. And David, you, uh, you massage this term nicely for us, refutation. Today we're reading Refutation of the Gentiles, Greeks mostly, but Gentiles, non-Jews. And what we saw yesterday was how part of what we saw, Jewish insight into scriptures and time is transfigured in the light of Christ. I think part of what we see this time is how Greek idea of Gentile idea of cosmos and being is transfigured in the light of Christ. And so, and as you said, in, in each of these session, sections, a uh, broad section is Athanasius is not so much condemning or trying to cut apart, but he's saying, Look at this gift and look how it's transfigured when we draw near it. Yesterday was unbelief. Unbelief. And his strategy was, But look at your own scriptures. Look at what your own opens up about the eternal. Today it's mockery, not unbelief. No one has had more insight into being than the Greek culture that Athanasius is talking about right now. Just like probably no one has had as much insight into time as the Jewish culture that Athanasius is talking about. This is in the section 
of the Greeks, not the Jews. And I was just, when I was listening to you, I was wondering, would he say this to Jews? Would they understand it? Would, would, they, would, would this be simpler for them to understand, which is different? He's saying it to Greeks. The Greek <laughs> idea of investing kind of the whole cosmos with godlikeness. Their highest holinesses are impersonal. Then they have the, the, the raft of gods, which you just referred to, the Zeus, well, from other cultures, Baal, Aphrodite, etc. There was a, a strong sense that there was much greater reality beyond the person in the impersonal. But also, the realm of the gods was that realm to which we aspired. But their image of godlikeness is quite distinct from what Christ teaches and what our tradition teaches. And so I hear in this as well, Athanasius saying, we need to recast renew our sense of, of the being of the human and the being of God. And then he says, when things come to, are drawn together, something new appears. The beginning of the Jewish scriptures declare that we are made in the image and likeness of God. That's the gift from the beginning. That's not new to us. The Greeks Maybe we emulate, we seek to, to join the gods in the Elysian fields. This is really distinct. And so I guess that maybe one way to put it back to you, David, initially is, it strikes, I might be wrong, it strikes me that this would not be said the same way to a kind of questioning Jewish audience. He's, he's writing with, with Greek questions in mind with this phrase. And so then... That means, too, we have to be careful of abstracting the phrase as if it just applies everywhere. Like, uh, like it's a, a formula that we uh, must repeat and put on a, a poster. And you've nicely taken apart that, that idea, David, that, that kind of crude stance. But there seem to be two things, some insight into being or becoming, which the Greeks did not see on, on the level of humanity as being very real. And also, how would this sound in Jewish ears who have a very distinct notion of deity and, and, and holiness than, than the Greeks to whom he's, I mean, he's not, he's not just portioning his text, now only Jews read this, now only Greeks read this. It's not like that, but there's, a, there's an emphasis. And of course, as we said yesterday, we're not actually talking about Jews and Greeks. In the end, we are, of course, he is, but not not in the end. He's talking about just humanity, and so it's a stance of the soul, <laughs> or a disposition of the mind, as you like to say, David, that is at play here too. So that's where I, that's how I approach the. It's it's a really important matter in the day before us. That's my initial response. Way in, what do you think? Yeah, lovely, lovely, nicely. Very nicely said. It is interesting in in his text, just a little uh, earlier on, in what we read today, when he quotes from Acts, he's really seen Paul as a Greek. And of course he was. He was a Greek Jew. <laughs> but Paul was the first one to struggle, as you said, Andrew, with these Greek notions of being and of how the divine was seen, how the cosmos was seen, and in some ways how little that had to do with humans. So when we think of his reference here to Paul as Greek, we also remember Paul going up on Tamar's Hill after spending the day wandering in Athens and stopping, attending 
to the various shrines and temples. And then going to Mars Hill, the hill of the God of War, where there's a soapbox. And taking his turn, standing on that soapbox and speaking as a Greek. I mean, he's in, he includes himself in this, I think. He says, I spent the day wandering around and seeing all these deities that we treasure, that we make something of. You Greeks, the Greek in me, we love our sacralities. And then I noticed something. I was stunned. I hadn't considered it before, although my life has been turned around by it. And there it was, that shrine to the unknown God, to the God above the gods. And it is him who I come to tell you about, that which is beyond the sacralities, that which makes it possible for being to be in becoming to be towards God, to be towards the unfolding word. Him I come to declare to you. No, thank you, Andrew. I would like to um, have us finish by reading 57, which is the, the culmination. Page 173. But in addition to the study and true knowledge of the scriptures, there is, a ne there is needed a good life and a pure soul and the virtue which is according to Christ, so that the mind guided by it may be able to attain and comprehend what it desires as far as it is possible for human nature to learn about the God word. Without a pure mind and a life modeled on the saints, no one can comprehend the words of the saints. For just as if someone would wish to see the light of the sun, he would certainly wipe and clear his eyes, purify himself to be most like that which he desires. So that as the eye thus becomes light, it may see the light of the sun, or just as if someone would wish to, it may see or wish to see a city or a country. He would certainly go to that place for the sight in the same way, in the same way. One wishing to comprehend the mind of the theologian We have to remember for Athanasius, 
The theologian is the person that prays. The person that prays is the theologian. An echo, well, very early. Actually, Simone Weil's quote is an echo of this. One wishing to comprehend the mind of the theologian must first wash and cleanse his soul by his manner of life. Let go of the passions and approach the saints themselves by the imitation of their work so that being with them in the conduct of a common life, he may understand also the things revealed to them. And henceforth, as joined to them, may escape the perils of the sinners and their fires on the day of judgment, but may receive what has been laid up for the saints in the kingdom of heaven, which eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor have they entered into the heart of man. Whatsoever things have been prepared for those who live a virtuous life and love the God and Father in Christ Jesus our Lord, through whom and with whom, to the Father, with the Son himself, in the Holy Spirit, be honor and power and glory to the ages of ages. when we abide in Christ, <clears throat> when we draw near to the word, when our logoi draws near to the word and draws near to the word of others, when we abide in Christ near to God, in the presence of the kingdom. When this grace is in us, we bring nothing. This is the kenosis that we participate in. In this place of kenosis, of emptiness, which really is what is meant by purity of heart we draw near the kingdom of heaven. That is, into a presence that is unfolding, which eye has not seen, nor ear heard, in which there is no presumption, nor have they entered into the heart that Indeed, all things are made new. All things are made new in joy. The kingdom is within. The kingdom is among. The kingdom is coming. <clears throat> so the incarnation of Jesus Christ invites us, or so it seems to me, to our incarnation, to become like the saints, to imitate the saints, is to become incarnate, is to live the life you've given, you've been given. Our own becoming enfleshed in the world of God's making. Not in the world of our making, in the world of God's making. 
Only then are we free from a world of our own making, a world that does not exist, but can be nurtured as tragically a real illusion in ways that destroy the very foundation of our life together. We can, and alas, we do, I do, create detritus. But we can also, and to this we are called, turn the dry places into fertile land when we seek to be faithful to Adonai. It was so for Abraham and Sarah. And it is our calling. There is a sense, I think, you referred to it, Ted, that that revelation by the Oaks of Marmory, where Abraham stood in the flap of his tent and saw the three strangers. That was a moment of purity of heart. That was a moment of a mind in ever moving repose, as Maximus calls it. And that is why he rushed out and begged that they not pass by. That is why he washed their feet, killed a fatted calf. That is why they had dinner together. And in that moment of meeting the stranger, there was an annunciation. The strangers say, when time arises, you will have a child. When time arises, new life will be born. The word, only when we dwell in the word, as Athanasius taught us several days ago, only when we dwell in the word does something occur which among all the miracle stories of the world is the most important miracle story that we read of in the Gospels. A person blind from birth sees. A person deaf from birth hears. That is, the generations no longer prevail. But we are in the presence. It is unfolding. It greets us. <laughs> Thank you. It's been lovely to um, think and talk with you about this. And I appreciate you the way you've attended to it. I would like to mention that in August, Andrew will be doing the St. Macrina seminar on a work by St. Maximus the Confessor. And um, I hope you can join us for that.